Welcome viewers to our ongoing program, Nuclear Free Future Conversation, coming to you from Channel 17, Center for Media and Democracy here in Burlington, Vermont. And our guest today is a returning guest, Mary Olson, who is on Skype from Aspen, North Carolina. Hello, Mary. Thank you so much for coming back. Thank you, Margaret, for inviting me. I'm glad to be here. Yes, and our title that we have decided upon is the Gender and Radiation Impact Project. So Mary, you gave us such enlightenment and uh, insight into the uh, gender matters in the atomic age, which was the first program I had the joy of doing with you. And now uh, I believe that you will, will expand on those insights. And uh, if you would, Take us back a little bit to uh, the what you had told us in our first program, Gender Matters in the Atomic Age. And, um, well, the first question is the uh, reference man. The reference man and what is the problem with him? Well, it really is a historical uh, situation. When fission became an activity that human beings do. We have tiny traces of it in some uranium deposits, but industrial scale fission began on a particular day in December of 1942 in Chicago. And since then, human beings have been splitting atoms and creating new radiation and new radioactivity. And so in that context, the people who were um, creating first nuclear weapons and then nuclear energy with fission, uh, were studying radiation, were regulating the exposure to workers, and these workers were almost all military males and paramilitary males. And so the study and the focus was on what became known as reference man, a defined weight a defined climate, a defined lifestyle. He's defined as white and either North American or Western European. So this is a case that you can look up and see what reference man is. And at the time they did it, it was relevant. So, oh, and you're saying that all the years of data is are from, from the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki are, is based on reference man. No, I'm sorry, You're, there's a confusion here. Yeah, okay. What Reference Man is used for is every single nuclear license in the United States. Our federal agencies use Reference Man to evaluate every single radiation exposure, to project every single radiation risk, to define the radiation um, standards and rules which a nuclear license is supposed to meet in order to protect the public. And I was invoking the history of the Manhattan Project because at that time, he made sense. Reference Man was relevant to the workers of the Manhattan Project. But nobody stopped to look and listen and think about the fact that the federal agencies still use Reference Man for facilities that are affecting the general public, who are affecting women and girls and boys and men. In, in other words, our entire population are impacted by emissions from nuclear weapons factories, but also nuclear energy sites, also nuclear medicine, also normal x-rays like dental and medical diagnosis. Um, all of these are licensed by the federal government, and to this very day, they use reference man for evaluating those radiation um, projected exposures. Okay, so Mary, what is the Gender and Radiation Impact Project? Then? Well, it is work that I did um, coming out of 20 years of doing educating and activism and organizing for the Nuclear Information and Resource Service. During that time, I became increasingly aware that um, not all radiation is to adult men. It is to, indeed, our entire life cycle. And our previous interview went into great detail about the shifts in my own life and my own work that led to findings that radiation is far more harmful to female bodies of all age 
but particularly when the exposures are to young girls. As much as 10 times more cancer results if a female is exposed when she's between birth and five years old, 10 times more cancer over her lifetime than is projected if you're using reference man. So this means that our federal regulators are underestimating the impact of radiation from their licenses. They're underestimating the amount of cancer that could result from medical and dental x-rays. They're underestimating the amount of cancer that could result from natural activities like flying in an airplane where there's less shielding um, because we're up high in the atmosphere, let alone space where we're talking now about potentially human beings traveling on a civilian basis, not just military and paramilitary people for whom reference man is still a relevant idea. But when you're talking about the entire species and all of our ages, reference man is the most resistant. Now he's harmed, but he's the most resistant to radiation. So gender and radiation impact project to come to your question is a new incorporated nonprofit, which is intended to be a, a project more for the next five or 10 years to help kickstart independent research. Because I can tell you that there's this 10 times difference. Um, we can unfold the fact that there's other ratios in the mix, but that's the biggest difference is between the young female and the adult male. Um, and that's the time of exposure, when that exposure happens, and then the cancers are over the lifetime that remains. Um, so it's not just little girl cancer that we're talking about. It's women who were exposed as children getting cancer over their lifetime. So we can talk about all that, but then you ask the question, why? Why is there a difference? And nobody has even asked that question in a research setting yet. And it's that type of activity that Gender and Radiation Impact Project is setting out to raise funds and to raise interest and focus so that um, we can start generating a new literature on radiation because our current literature is all based on reference man. We need a new literature and in the process we will also get something else that's tremendously valuable. We'll get a new generation of young people coming up with their PhDs, MDs, public health degrees um, as experts, as independent researchers, and that by itself is worthy of a five or ten year project. And Mary, what is, what is the public health threat now from radiation? Well, if you understand that civilian nuclear activities as a whole are licensed by an agency that only looks at the most resistant portion of our life cycle for its standards, for its rules, for its regulations, for its licenses. So this includes nuclear energy, nuclear waste, nuclear fuel production, mining. It includes medical and dental diagnoses and treatment. It includes um, occupational exposures. So in this huge category, we have female bodies that are being harmed more than male bodies. And we have women and girls who don't know this. We have parents who do not know this. We have spouses who do not know this. We have best friends who do not know this. And if they did, they might possibly make choices in a different way. Um, and so the, the health threat is been there since we started all this in the last hundred years or so since the atomic age has begun. Um, females have been disproportionately impacted this whole time, which means that all kinds of radiation health effects, but the regulators only look at cancer. So as much as 10 times more cancer has been due to radiation exposure than any part of our society has acknowledged. Therefore, we could have prevented that much more cancer had we had this awareness. And if we begin to understand why there's a difference, we might actually be able to be very specific in the prevention and or possibly mitigation. I have no idea. But right now, we're just invisible. 
And Mary, are, are there are, are there individuals who, in the workplace, who are particularly threatened and who there the evidence is there, right to, for us to see today? Since I did the research in 2011 showing this dis disproportionate impact, and I want to mention, as always, that it is. I'm the second person to look and the second person to find these differences. It was Dr. Arjun Makajani and his co-authors, um, Smith and Thorne, who published in 2006. I was unaware of their work until after I published mine. Um, we're both published on websites, so it's not too surprising that I missed the, missed the memos. But it's now pretty settled science when you have two independent looks at uh, data that came from the National Academy of Science. So it's not really edgy independent research at all. It's just an independent analysis of very mainstream data. And so having done that, now when I go into medical settings, that all the taking me to get my x-rays. I've had my ankle replaced. I had a CT scan. I had a whole slew of x-rays and every year x-rays. Very rarely is it a guy who's taking me for my x-rays. It's almost always a woman. Um, every time I have my teeth done and they do x-rays there. It's women who are the technicians. Um, interventional med medicine, where they actually use um, radiation, again, while they're doing surgery. Very often, the nurses in the surgical setting are females. So there's a disproportionate number of females in radiation workplaces. None of them know that they are disproportionately harmed. Um, look at aviation. All the women who are serving on airplanes, they are constantly in a higher radiation level, and yet they don't know that they are at higher risk than males who are in the same job. Mary, do it, it, what, what's that? I think they should know. Of I think course. they should have the information, and I think society should protect everyone. And is is there research now that is giving numbers of the of women in, in, in threatening jobs like that? Um, there's a website called Big Data that I consulted um, to get numbers of women who are radiation technicians, and it's well over 70% female. Um, same with uh, aviation and the service crews on planes, well over 70% female in, for the United States. Um, and there are plenty of uh, situations where males are also in occupations that include radiation. And I don't want to dismiss those because males are harmed. It's just they aren't harmed as much as females. And what is a research catalyst that is in, in your uh, description of the Gender and Radiation Impact Project? So what is that? Let's go ahead and mention the website. There, there is a Gender and Radiation Impact Project website, and on that website is where you're seeing that. And a catalyst is really about a chemical relationship where one of the molecules present is helping two others get together. And there are people out in the world who have plenty of resources. They're looking for good things to do with their money and their legacy. And there are currently researchers who would be very happy to add gender questions to their study of radiation health effects. But in order to do that, they need postdoctoral research assistance and they need students who are coming up in these fields. And so the money that I am raising through Gender and Radiation Impact Project would be either directly or through the project um, used to fund these young researchers joining already established labs. Um, there are ongoing research on radiation that simply is not including these gender questions. And I have leaders who have pledged that they will add these questions if they have additional help, which means they need additional money. It's pretty reasonable. And on your website also, there are there is a promise of better and healthier solutions. What are What are you talking about there? I think that we come from, you and I, a background of activism and grassroots awareness, and that that's a very important piece. But in this case, 
I honestly believe that we need a new generation of experts to lead the way for better policy and better regulation. I would never want a six-year-old girl to be faced with her doctor telling her that she needed a CT exam, which, if she needs it, in my humble view, she, her parents, the doctor, they should all agree it should be disclosed, and then she has it. If, there's no sense in avoiding long-term health consequences if your life is in danger. You need to save lives with some of these imaging, and I'm not saying we don't do that. But if the little girl was the one who knew that she had a 10 times higher risk of getting cancer from that CT scan than the published literature on that scan, and her doctor did not know that, that's a bad situation. I would rather have a generation of doctors who know that. So I'm actually verging away from grassroots right to know type approach on this and um, moving into let's get new experts. I think it's a perfectly wonderful goal to have a generation of experts who can lead on this and who I hope will lead on it because it is, we're talking about a 1% increase in a 100,000 person population who are the survivors of the horrific action that the United States took in using A-bombs on cities full of people. The survivor lifespan study is the only data set that includes all ages and both genders. And so that is where these findings come from. We're talking about a 1% increase for the little girls in terms of risk of cancer from a exposure about like a CT scan, frankly. Um, but at the global population, that is now a very large number of people. 1% of 100 million women is a million women. And that, to me, is why we must not sit down and say, oh, this is a small difference. It doesn't matter. It's just lost in the um, uncertainty. Well, 10 times is not small, and it is not lost in the uncertainty. And therefore, we need to start tracking down the additional questions that come. And the questions you're asking are good ones. Okay, and Mary, how can the Gender and Radiation Impact Project move current research ahead and generate support for independent research? Well, the biggest thing we need, quite frankly, is money. But um, Raising awareness amongst researchers is resulting in some researchers who already have funding saying that they will engage with um, these questions. Um, Dr. David Richardson at University of North Carolina School of Public Health is currently studying nuclear workers. He says that over time, more women are becoming nuclear workers, which kind of gives me pause, but nonetheless, his data set that he's studying is having more and more women. And he has said he wants to start asking questions about differences between males and females based on the work that I have done and others. And so this is one little tiny example of how information as well as money can, can move us in the right direction. And Mary, is that independent research then? Yes, Dr. Richardson is in a very renowned uh, research institution, the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. And he, while he gets federal funding, he does so on an independent basis. And that brings to mind about the Department of Energy. Do they presently control most of radiation research? They control most of the federal money that goes to radiation research. And this is through a set of very indirect pathways, but was documented documented some years ago by the Union of Concerned Scientists. And quite frankly, the U.S. Department of Energy, which has the nuclear weapons production complex, they make the nuclear weapons, they clean up the nuclear weapons complex from the Cold War. Um, they have the largest workforce that is exposed daily at work to radi ionizing radiation. So they not only have um, federal interest in controlling the money, but they also have the biggest liability. And it wasn't until Secretary Richardson, under President Clinton, Bill Clinton, um, that the federal government even acknowledged that radiation is harmful and set up a compensation program for some um, 
atomic veterans and Cold War workers have been compensated. But the research world is a bit of a jungle. I have every confidence that once there is a literature, um, the way science, basic science works is once others start responding to those papers and science takes over. So what we need is a kickstart and Gender and Radiation Impact Project is committed to being that kickstart. And uh, this is wonderful, Mary. This is, is, is just very hopeful news and uh, you are both a, an activist and an advocate in this and also a keeper of, a keeper and sharer of knowledge. So it is, a, it, it's with great uh, pleasure that we are hearing from you today. And are you advocating also for more international research? Absolutely. Um, this relatively small effort, Gender and Radiation Impact Project, has no designs to own any of these questions, to own the enterprise of getting research going. Anyone, anywhere who wants to tackle this, I encourage good basic science methods because that's what moves us forward. But um, at any level that anyone can engage with these questions is very important. And I just want to mention that it's not only the Nuclear Regulatory Commission in the United States that has this bias. The Environmental Protection Agency has senior staff who believe that little girls are a subpopulation. Now, I'm going to take just a moment to, to unwrap this because they have said they've gotten rid of reference man, but they're still using the adult portion of the population, male and female. They're averaging the greater harm to females with the lesser harm of males, which does not protect females. And then they're just sidelining children as a whole group. Well, little boys actually are five times more affected by radiation exposure than are adult males. So times five if you're a little boy, times 10 if you're a little girl, um, which by the way shows us that little girls and little boys are still a doubling when you compare those two. You know, twice as much cancer if you're exposed as a little girl than a little boy. Wouldn't parents like to know about that, choosing a CT scan or deciding just how many intercontinental airplane flights to take with their littlest children? Um, these are all points of information that are needed, but when the US EPA guy says, oh, they're just a subpopulation, we'll deal with them later, he has absolutely no knowledge base that the human being is a life cycle. We cannot have an adult male or female without a little girl or a little boy. It just doesn't work that way. So this idea that it's a whole population phenomenon, on the one hand, yes, but on the other hand, if we're talking about actually protecting and preserving and preventing and having future generations who are healthy, then the only reference that we can and should take, and again, I'm talking about people who are already born, but is the little female body between birth and five years old. That is the group that is the most impacted. That is the portion of the life cycle that is most impacted. And so when you ask me about better protection, we need a reference little girl. And if we use a reference little girl, then it will protect everybody, including adult males, better. What's wrong with that? And so, I, see, I see, Mary, on your website too, the goal of, of the impact study is to keep our grandchildren from experiencing harm from radiation. That gives us great pause to think of, of the generational impact. Absolutely. We've had a fling with radiation. We can do nearly everything, energy, security, imaging. We have all kinds of options now that are not um, ionizing radiation. And there's every reason to reduce and eventually phase out all of it. And, and when you talk to about the, uh, the intersection of public health, medicine, and public policy, uh, you're saying that the impact, the Gender and Radiation Impact Project is, is involved in all of those, public health, medicine, and public policy. So uh, can you give us some idea of the public policy and how, how the viewers today can get involved with public policy? Well, for those 
those who are hearing this, you have a right to know that radiation is more harmful to females of every age group, most harmful to the youngest females, still harmful to males of all ages. So knowing that and going to the Gender and Radiation Impact Project website if you need more information, um, allows you to raise this in every setting. If you're already active on making public comments on energy policy or security policy or um, interacting with your elected officials on any of these issues, go right ahead and bring this up because it is the attention grabber that helped to bring us the new treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons. It was this very fact that radiation harms female bodies more than male bodies that made the diplomats of the world pay attention and re-engage with the thought that maybe we could live without nuclear weapons. So we have other imaging. We have all kinds of occupations that people could do without being exposed at work. And for those who remain exposed at work, we could protect and prevent better. And so, yes, we are at the, that intersection. And as we build the cadre of new experts, people coming out with PhDs and MDs, part of the function of the project will be to bring them together at symposia where they can exchange papers and ideas and build a network so that these people become effective leaders in helping to change policy and practice. Mary, this is a very strong advocacy that you're presenting to us. And, what, and you say it's a five-year project. And can you tell us what is the uh, immediate uh, short-term goal? $10 million. Oh, OK. <laughs> and and we'll, take, we'll take $10. I mean, um, at the moment, it's an all-volunteer activity. But I honestly believe that there are industries where there's a lot of money flowing, where it would be in their interest to address these matters. We offer a conduit to independent researchers um, that is a nonprofit, public, IRS rep, uh, recognized 501c3. So money can come through the project to research, or we can just play the Rosen Cavalier, the matchmaker, and match up donors and um, major institutions that are themselves able to take grants. Um, the goal is to get intensive work done in the next five years so that we can get a new literature, which is what's necessary. My little PowerPoints are not enough. Dr. Makajani's paper, um, Science for the Vulnerable, is not enough. We need published papers in peer-reviewed journals. And um, I'm excited to say I have one coming, but I, I'm just going to do one. It's really for the next generation. And um, once we have a literature, then you know, the American Medical Association should be hearing about this. But my PowerPoints are not enough. We need a literature. Can you tell us a little bit about this paper that's going to come out? Yeah, it's the Interdisciplinary Science Review published out of the United Kingdom. And the guest editor, um, Elizabeth Pollitzer, invited me to do a paper. She's the organizer of something called the Gender Summits. And these are events that are for evidence-based work on addressing the inequities at every level of society between male and female. And um, she's had me speak at two of the gender summits in Europe and uh, reached out when she got this uh, special edition on gender of Interdisciplinary Science Review. The volume is a June 2019 volume. And um, it's a relatively short paper, but it just publishes in peer review the findings that there's this big difference. Yeah, well, well, we'll look forward to reading that. And, uh, and for right now, uh, for the purposes of our, our short program, which is so full of information and hope for us, can you, uh, can you sign off with, with any kind of uh, message for us? Certainly. Um, we can prevent so much more illness from radiation than we have so far. And if we take the most harmed part of our life cycle, the young female, and make her the basis of regulation, 
there are so many activities that will be done more safely and better for everybody. So reference little girl is my final statement. Let's have reference little girl. Thank you, Mary Olson, Acting Director of the Gender and Radiation Impact Project. Thank you very much. Goodbye for now.